All right. Hello, all, and welcome to our webinar on harbor seal pups and human interactions. Um, as you can all tell by the hot weather, uh, beach season is here, and the people are ready to party like it's 2019. Uh, but unfortunately, humans aren't the only mammals that use our coastlines this time of year, and harbor seal pups are a common sight. And today we're here to teach you a little bit about how to share the shore with these cutie pies out there on the beach. Um, so I'm joined with an awesome cast here. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm with the Seacoast Science Center. Uh, we have Ainsley from NOAA Fisheries here um, and Lisa Becker from National Marine Life Center. And as always, Ashley Stokes, our Marine Mammal Rescue Manager over here. Um, so thanks, thanks everyone, you know, for for joining us. And uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we have a lot on the table here today. Uh, a lot of really interesting stuff to to talk about. So I don't know if you want to each introduce yourself quick and talk about you know maybe how how you find yourself here and and dealing with human interactions with uh, these these harbor seal pups. Let's start with uh, Ainsley. Sure, thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. Um, so my role at NOAA Fisheries is to work with our regional stranding network partners. So both our rescue and response teams like Seacoast and our rehabilitation teams like Lisa and NMLC and our other rehab facilities. And I also spend a lot of time working with our outreach and communications departments. And we're always trying to find new ways to share information about SEALs and making sure everybody knows the best way to act around them to minimize any harmful actions. Nice. Thanks, Ansley. And over to you, uh, Lisa. How about yourself? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> my role here at the National Marine Life Center is to, to manage our rehabilitation program for marine animals, um, seals and sea turtles uh, and some native turtles. So really my main focus is to make sure the program is running. Um, animals are admitted from all over the region. They um, go through the rehabilitation program and ideally um, be released back into the wild. Um, and, um, you know, on, on the side of that, I, I also, um, you know, take care of the management of our volunteer base. We have a large community of people that, that help us with the work we do, um, which is really great. So, um, right. yeah. Yeah, thanks for being here, Lisa. And Ashley, um, I know we, we have a seal that's out there right now, so this is very, very relevant. But uh, <laughs> if you want to... <laughs> yeah, so if you want to introduce yourself quick and... Sure. And, uh... um, so my name is Ashley Stokes. I am the um, director of the Marine Mammal Rescue Program uh, here at the Seaco Science Center. And basically what that means is I run all of the day-to-day um, -day operations and kind of coordinate everything for out in the field, um, as well as going out into the field for a lot of these responses. Um, so Brian mentioned we do have one out there right now. Uh, so I pre-apologize to those of you watching um, if somebody else is talking, if I look like I'm on my phone, um, but I'm actually just on the hotline trying to coordinate uh, response for this little harbor seal we have out there right now. Um, but yep. fortunately for him, it's raining, it's windy, so there's very few people on the beach. <laughs> yep, never a dull moment. And this the stuff that we're gonna be talking about is constantly relevant. Um, so we're gonna get things rolling here, uh, first by talking about a little bit of introduction to harbor seal pupping season. So Ashley, if you wanna speak a little bit about the biology of these animals and why they overlap, it's, it's incredible how they overlap with like the 4th of July, all these busy, <laughs> busy beach seasons. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll start by setting that preface. Sure. Um, so yeah, the, you know, these harbor seals, harbor seals are the most common species for us up here. Um, and when I say up here, I mean, New Hampshire and Northern Massachusetts is the area that Seco Science Center is responsible for. Um, so harbor seals are a pretty small seal species. They top out at about five to six feet in length and about 200 to 250 pounds. Um, but when these animals are born, typically in, say, May and June, they give birth to their young. But it seems to be starting a little bit earlier, in the tail end of April, the last couple of years. But when these pups are born, they look very vulnerable. They're very small. They call out to mom a lot. Um, but believe it or not, these animals are only with their mother for 21 to 28 days. And then they're completely independent. So you can imagine, especially those of you out there that are parents, what that's like on these young animals. So there's a lot in those first three to four weeks of life that they need to learn to do to live out there in the wild. And when humans interfere with that or get too close and cause the mother to abandon the pup, those pups are dependent 
on the mother during that time. So they cannot survive on their own, which is why, especially during those first few weeks of life, it's extremely crucial that people are obeying the laws and keeping away from these animals so that they can live their natural life and not be imprinted by humans. That's Aw, that's awesome. And I also, uh, I'm going to pull up a quick video too right here that has some vocalizations of uh, one of these harbor seal pups. So if you do hear this, um, that means that there is a harbor seal pup nearby on the beach and this, you know, and that you want to keep your distance because they are still dependent on their mother. So let me pull that up here real, real quick for you. Yeah. So you can hear, you know, it tugs at the heartstrings a little bit, uh, but it's completely normal for these young animals to make that sound. It's how they find their mother. It's how they identify with their mother. Um, that one pup in particular, which you'll hear a little bit more about shortly, um, though you can hear the vocalizations were extremely coarse. Um, that animal was extremely thin and extremely dehydrated. So just like you or I, if we've been talking a lot or shouting a lot, our vocal cords might get a bit strained and a little bit coarse as well. And it's similar to that pup, which is why it sounded that way. Yeah. And, and Ashley, what you just mentioned too, about, you know, they're, they're dependent on their, their mothers for just a very short period of time, where we are at, where are we at right now in the Harbor Seal pupping season? Yeah. So this is a tough time of year for responders because we're kind of right on the cusp of some of these pups are now weaned from mom and they're just trying to figure out life on their own. Um, it's not uncommon during that those first couple of weeks for these pups to lose a lot of their body weight because they're not nursing from their mother anymore. Um, they're out there trying to hunt and catch those fish on their own. But there are possibly still some pups out there that were born later in the pupping season that are still dependent pups. So we try to take all of those things into very close consideration. Certainly, we don't want to be taking pups if the mother is potentially still around, um, the ocean is the best place for these animals to be. Um, whereas being in captivity and being handled by people to get them back out there in the wild is not ideal. So we try not to do that if we don't have to, uh, which is why you know, a lot of you that are very familiar with our organization probably sometimes might say to yourself, my gosh, all the time they're telling us, stay away from these animals, enjoy them from a distance. But that truly is the take home message here is to enjoy them from afar. Let them be wild animals and don't interfere with them. Yeah, really, really good stuff, Ashley. Thanks. Um, and so now we're going to move on to our next bit here, which is discussing some common human interactions that occur with harbor seals. So literally these animals are threatened uh, by us. You know, they're, they're almost loved to death by us because they're so cute and we want to get so close to them and, and we end up harassing them. And so Ainsley, um, if you could speak a little bit more about the common human interactions that we see across our whole network, you know, that, that would be really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as Ashley was saying, the best way to observe them is to stay back and to not interfere. And that comes from the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which oversees our stranding network and all of our response activities. And the big takeaway from that is that your behavior shouldn't change the animal's behavior. So staying back 150 feet is the best way to ensure that we are not interfering. And unfortunately, that doesn't always work or people don't know what to do. So we see a lot of different types of human interactions. Um, so far this summer, we've seen some of people moving seals, either putting them back into the water or taking them physically off the beach and separating them from mom. Either they're trying to drive them to a veterinarian or to take them home or um, to take them to a friend who knows how to rehabilitate other wildlife. And again, that, that separates an animal from mom potentially while it's still learning from mom or relying on mom for food. Um, and so that's very dangerous for the pup. We also have seen some instances of seals either being poured water on them or being wrapped up in blankets. And both of those uh, mess with the animal's body temperature. And Lisa could talk more about that as well. Um, in that these are small animals, they don't have a lot of fat yet. Um, they're still 
learning how to handle the environment. Um, and so when they're lying on a beach, which is a normal part of their life, um, they are there to rest and recover and um, you know, have a, have a relaxing day before they go back into the water or before they're dealing with any other environmental stress. So those are, those are big um, disruptors to their day. Obviously, if you were trying to take a nap and someone threw a bucket of ice water on you or wrapped you up and overheated you on a hot day, that wouldn't feel good at all. And then one of our other big concerns that we see are people interacting with their dogs and seals. Um, a lot of beaches have off-leash days or off-leash dog hours. And that's another interaction that we try to minimize with a wild animal and your pet. Diseases could be passed back and forth between the two of them. Or even if there isn't a bite, just the barking of your dog as it's trying to investigate new smells or this new animal could be very stressful to a seal pup that's just trying to rest. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those are really good points. So, so to summarize, um, don't never feed the seals. Right? They don't need food. They don't need tuna sandwiches. That's absolutely absolutely true. not. They they don't. And one of the big I agree. One of the biggest ones we see is water. You know, people trying to pour water on them or pulling. Uh, you know, we've heard of people pulling them back into the ocean because they think that's where they belong. But um, actually, I'm going to share this this infographic that uh, Noah, Noah created. Um, you know, like human seals can actually drown. Um, you know, when they, like you mentioned, when they are on these beaches, they they are resting, and especially especially these young harbor seal pups. Um, you know, they they need that rest. Otherwise, they might they're, they're exhausted a lot of the times. They're figuring out how to survive. So, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of really simple things, and it all comes down to staying 150 feet back. Um, Ainsley, I know we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but social media, right? That's a big, you know, a big driver of some of these behaviors. Do you think you could speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. Yeah. That's something that's really come up in the last few years and everyone wants to take a great picture and share it with your friends and get lots of attention from that. But every instance of someone coming up just to take one or just to take that one picture, um, adds another stressful interaction into that animal's day. And then if you post it to your neighborhood group or your friend's Facebook page, that's going to draw more attention if everyone else wants to come down to the beach and see that seal or take that picture. And every one of those interactions really adds up over a day, over a weekend of this animal just trying to rest and recover and go on its way. Every single interaction really does add up. Yeah, and that's something we'll speak a little bit more about in terms of uh, actual real life cases that we are currently dealing with at NMLC and and SS and Seco Science Center. But uh, Ashley, Ashley and Lisa, I know that as an organization, both both of our organizations have policies about posting to fit to social media. I know uh, Ashley, if you want to speak about our policy a little bit, I know we don't we never post locations until after. The, until after that animal's gone, correct? Right. Um, so that's an important takeaway um, from this. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, I had no idea it was there and I would have loved to have seen it. Um, but that's not what the idea is behind the work that we do. Um, yes, there are certainly a number of people and word does travel. Um, when there is a small seal or dolphin or whale, or whatever it may be, live or dead on the beach, um, but we intentionally never post the location, especially for live animals, while the animal is there. Um, because it has been shown that, you know, once it's posted and people share it over and over with the location, if people are in the area, they stop by to see that animal. Um, and again, the more attention that animal gets, the worse it is for it. Um, yeah. So you'll see that's why we never post the location while it's there. Sometimes we'll post, you know, we are responding to an animal right now on the shore with a photo just so that people kind of know what we're up to, but we don't post the exact location until that animal is either removed or goes back in the water on its own. Yeah. And Lisa, does NMLC have a similar policy? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, we mostly, our our people here that either the volunteers that work with the animals um, or even people that, you know, come into a visitor center to, to see what we do, we have, um, we have a policy that Nobody is allowed to post um, on their own account. Everything um, that we want to share is, you know, is discussed and shared only by NMLC um, to really make sure that we can control um, 
exposure to these animals. Um, as, as you've all pointed out, they're very sensitive to stress, but they also eventually will habituate to humans. So we try to limit that as, you know, to the best of our ability. So um, to go in just to uh, take a photo of an animal or to videotape an animal never happens. Um, the, if we need to take photos for medical reasons or to share an update, this is combined with other procedures so that we can limit that. Um, if visitors come into um, our facility, they stay um, in our discovery center where they can see the animals through our web webcams um, so that there is no direct exposure um, yeah. to, to the patients um, to reduce the stress and, and just, you know, the risk of habituation. So, um, yeah. and, and then the last part of it, I mean, Ashley just mentioned people, you know, then they say, oh, uh, you know, really would have liked to seen it on the beach or, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we sometimes run into this with um, releases. I mean, even though the animals are rehabilitated and they're ready to go back out into the wild, but um, we we do try to, to minimize the crowds as much as we can when we when we do those releases. And we also have some candidates where we really want to focus on, on our private releases, what we call them really, really small groups. And then we, we share everything on video later because we really want to make sure these animals are not being followed when they just go back out to the beach and and um, kind of you know figure out their surroundings, especially if it if we have patients that were so young they probably even either haven't been in the ocean before or they really just you know don't quite know yet how to survive and how to live out in the wild. So um, it doesn't help to have you know a huge crowd of people standing around them when they when they leave. So yeah, and and I'll just add one thing quick here. When, when Ashley and I, for example, are out on our response, I tell a lot of folks, you know, we, we go out there with our cameras. I have a 300 millimeter zoom lens, right? And we, we are taking photos to document these cases. I can promise you I'm taking a better photo with that than your iPhone. So <laughs> follow, if you want to share a photo or, or anything from that, you know, from you being there and seeing that seal, Follow us on social media and share the, the photos that we have afterwards. Share the messages that we are, you know, putting out there afterwards. It's going to be, I can promise you it's better than your iPhone photo. And you're not harassing any seals in the taking of, you know, and, and the sharing of that photo. So um, I, I definitely like just want to throw that in there too. But with that, let's move on to, um, you know, really why are human interactions harmful to seal pups? Like what do they physiologically do? Um, and, and you know, what, what do we see? You know, I know something we'll talk about is that they, they really waste time and resources. So um, we'll start with, with Ainsley here. Um, you know, what some of these human interactions that you spoke about, what exactly do they do to these animals? Sure. So as we saw in that first graphic, unfortunately, sometimes animals can drown if they're pushed back into the water, um, dropped off a boat or whatnot before they're ready to swim. Um, some of these seals are very young, very small, they're still learning how they should be swimming or how they should be acting. Um, unfortunately, we've had some of those cases in the last few years where, um, yeah, an animal's been forced in and it, it drowns. Um, really unfortunate. So, yeah, yeah. So there's there's that. That's one one big. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, their their survivability. Um, but Lisa, I know uh, when when people do step in and interfere with wildlife. Um, it, it, it creates less space at your rehabilitation facility, correct? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because some of these cases are really, um, you know, they're healthy. They're, there's not nothing necessarily uh, that they struggle with other than that human exposure. And, um, you know, a few things were pointed out before where, you know, I mean, yeah, drowning is, is, is certainly a, a big problem, um, especially, again, for, for younger seals. Not, not every seal species has the exact same... Um, sort of um, natural history in terms of, you know, the, the nursing and the weaning process. Some of them, they know how to swim, some don't. Um, and and also with just debilitated um, older seals, I mean, they, they come on land for a reason. So if you push them back in the water, then, then yeah, the risk of drowning is there. Also, um, if, if they're not in good condition, pouring water over them can really manipulate the body temperature. And, and you know, that can have a, have like, a, a, more, like a bigger effect on, um, you know, their physiological response and, and, and then triggers other problems. Um, 
and the stress itself that the human exposure can cause um, apart from potentially like dog interactions we see a lot of animals that have puncture wounds on their flippers whether they they were caused by wildlife or by dogs it's sometimes hard to tell but we see that very frequently and then again the the stress response is uh, significant i mean bringing wild animals into human care is already um stressful enough but we we oftentimes see uh, a more severe stress response with human interaction cases um and that can kind of indicators um, look, you know, slightly differently. If you have really lethargic animals, um, they're even more receptive to handling um, after they have gone through an experience like that. You can see um, respiratory stress just from, from that um, human interaction. You have can have elevated heart rates. Um, and just like, you know, some other phys physiological responses that make it really difficult for us to, to work with the animal and treat the animal. You also sometimes have um, patients that went through a human interaction scenario and um, that might not be as lethargic. Um, so in those cases, oftentimes we see a much more aggressive response to um, to us handling the animal. Um, I know we were, we're going to talk about some of those cases. One of them actually showed exactly that. Um, and um, yeah, so when that that triggers, um, you know, us to to really, um, you know, have like a, a husbandry plan in a, in a treatment and handling plan. Um, with, you know, taking, um, you know, those responses into account. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, we can we can talk about that. Yeah, more no, as well. that's what we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna jump right into that next is um, speaking a little bit about two of our our animals that uh, Seco Science Center responded to out you know in our response ter territory, Zeus and Hercules. Um, I believe Hercules is the one that you're speaking about, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Yeah, and so I'll I'll pull up some photos here of young Hercules. Um, that was actually that one that uh, I just pulled up before. This is Hercules here. Um, and Ashley, if you want to speak maybe a little bit about sort of the response, like the conditions around this, and then maybe Lisa can pull in, uh, tie together with the human interaction bit. Sure. Um, so this animal actually was technically outside of our response territory. Um, so I mentioned that we respond in all of New Hampshire and Northern Massachusetts, uh, right down to Essex, Mass, which for those of you familiar with the area is just south of the Crane Beach area uh, in Ipswich. Um, however, Hercules was in Gloucester, um, so that's a gap in coverage territory that um, NOAA Fisheries actually oversees currently um, until an organization steps up to take over that area. Um, however, you know, we don't like to see animals going unresponded to, um, so we are helping um, NOAA when needed to step in and respond to some of these cases, and this was a perfect example of that. Um, this animal was in Lane's Cove, in Gloucester, Mass, and it, you can see in the photo, is just really flat, really lethargic, um, and really thin, which again, I mentioned, as these animals wean from mom, they'll be nice and chubby if they were nursing really well, um, but sometimes it takes them a week or two to figure things out, and during that time, if they're not eating regularly, they'll lose a lot of that body weight. Um, but in addition to that, this animal's um, blood glucose level, which similar to a lot of us, especially those that are diabetics, closely monitor, um, this animal's blood glucose was only 67, uh, which is really low for these animals. Um, so that's part of why he was also so lethargic. Um, he was also dehydrated, which led to those really hoarse respirations. Um, and you can actually see in that photo there, generally if the animal is well hydrated, they have what we refer to as a hydration mask. Um, so even though the animal's fur was completely dry, he should still have a, a wet, almost like a mat around his eyes. And the bigger the hydration mask, generally the better hydrated they are. Um, but with that being said, sometimes when we step in and collect an animal and put it in a kennel, they can get a false hydration mask. So they almost get a stress response or a tearing in the eyes, which gives a false indicator of how hydrated they are. Um, but in addition for him, uh, because of the stressors and his just being really thin, he also had a temperature of 101 degrees. Um, so generally speaking, harbor seals are similar to humans in their body temp, um, but that was a bit high for him. Not alarmingly high, like you'll hear um, potentially with one of our other animals, but 
still pretty high that we had to deal with. The higher their body temp gets, um, sometimes they'll also get body tremors or start seizing as well, and their their inner organs will start to shut down. Um, so it's really close things, you know, to keep our eye on. Yeah, and what what human interactions did Hercules experience while he was on those beaches, Ashley? Mm -hmm. Um, so he reportedly, we can't confirm for sure, um, but he had a really large group of people, 30 to 40 people around him when we got our first call on the hotline. Um, so the very first thing we asked that individual to do was to just talk to the group and have them step back from the animal before we even talked further about what it looked like. Um, so she was great. She was really willing to do that. It sounds like the group complied for the most part. Um, and backed away from the animal. It was on rocks, um, so it was pretty easy to back away and give it some space. Um, but in addition to that, when we got out there, uh, we had already picked up the animal. We already were loading it into the truck, and one uh, someone out there um, who was actually a fisherman said, "See, not all commercial fishermen are bad. We called it in too." Um, but he was really mad at me when we poured water on him, and we were like, "Oh." So we talked about why you shouldn't do that. And he meant well, he thought he was helping yeah. that animal um, and the animal got defensive. But we also asked one of the people that called on the hotline, you know, in addition to everybody getting close, did anyone physically touch the animal? And the individual that we were speaking with at the time got very hesitant. And she was like, um, uh, I don't know. So that <laughs> to us indicates that it's, probable that the animal was touched as well. And again, oftentimes it's not people that have ill intentions. It's people that think they are doing things to help these animals, which is why education is so important and why we are constantly talking about the right things to do and how to help the animals. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to talk more about that in just a second too. Um, but Lisa, I want to hear your take on Hercules as well. What, how's his rehab looking? Um, and and what, what did you, you know, is there anything different that you do in rehab for a case like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, as, as Ashley indicated, you know, the, the physiological responses to the stress can, can really um, make that animal use its own resources even faster than, than an animal that, that doesn't have to go through such a strong stress response. And that is dehydration that was brought up, um, you know, these animals um, do get dehydrated quickly when they stop eating, but stress can also dehydrate them on top of that. So, um, you know, it's it's just, it, for us, it means that we have to really bring up hydration um, um, treatments even more. It burns through their um, blood glucose um, resources much faster. So as we know, um, Hercules's blood glucose was was fairly low, and um, and it continued to be um, like that for a few days. Um, and just in general, like their blood work can can uh, be affected, and you can see stress responses in the blood with certain indicators. So we we do have ways to um, really determine on what what stress level you know we're looking at. So for him we could very clearly see when he came in that he had a much higher um, defensive behavior, like higher aggression level than other seals do that don't necessarily go through that exposure. He was unnecessarily strongly defending himself when we approached him, which again, we, we, um, we see oftentimes after an experience like that. Um, and um, so that was that was what we went through for like a few days with him. It, it luckily it settled down a little bit. Um, so he is actually um, in a good way. He is in, he is progressing and improving um, fast now. At this point, he had he had a tough stretch initially where he was um, extremely dehydrated again, burning through his own resources um, and and um, very lethargic um, and. Um, on top of all of this, we, uh, with our diagnostic tools, we found out that he does suffer from pneumonia. So that um, also is actually an indicator, most likely, why he was resting, um, you know, extensively on the beach. Oftentimes, these animals um, really, if they have, if they're compromised um, in the respiratory system, they do not spend a lot of time in the water uh, because it is extremely exhausting for them. Uh, and um, they can't really, the healing process is heavily compromised if they would be swimming in cold, cold water for long periods of time. Um, on top of that, um, controlling body temperature after, you know, blankets have been put on the animals or 
um, cold water poured over them. It takes a few days um, for us to stabilize that and get the animal back under control. Um, good news for him is really in the last few days, he perked up a lot. He is now eating fish in the water on his own again. He is very alert. Um, he, he, uh, he shows us from just his behavioral responses that he, um, he, he wants more water access. We do taper that a little bit. Um, when we have cases um, that have, you know, some, you know, lung tissue damage, um, but he's he's on a on a good track. So um, I no, think he will. Yeah, yeah. That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the update on on Hercules, Lisa. Also love the name. Thanks for thanks for giving us <laughs> such great names for for seals. And I know mm -hmm. we got um. Next, we're gonna just just quickly before we give you some tips on how to help. Um, we're, we're gonna give a quick update on Zeus. Also, another great name. Um, you know, the, the, the strongest of all the, the Greek gods, I guess. Uh, but Zeus, Zeus wasn't a human interaction. Um, I actually have a, a quick little, you know, two minute video that actually you could probably explain a little bit of the, the res our response to Zeus. Um, and we'll, we'll, you know, show a, a little bit of where he's at. Um, yeah. So, so here's <laughs> Zeus. Yeah, so we responded to Zeus um, actually right down the street from Seaco Science Center, our offices here. And a homeowner called him in. Um, she lives in a home across the street. And you can see when he turns his head, the left side of his neck and face is extremely swollen. So we weren't exactly sure right off the bat why that was. Um, but the homeowner said that he had been there the previous day on the same rock. Um, so here he is. That was just him in a tide pool. He was not in open water. Um, but we decided that he needed to be picked up and needed that neck to be looked at. Um, so as soon as we got him in the kennel, um, we didn't hear about him until the second day. The homeowner said, you know, we see seals here all the time. He was active. He was moving around. So they didn't call him in the first day, which is fine. Um, but once we got him and got him in the kennel, um, you can actually see that wound started oozing. Um, so we couldn't even see the wound right off the bat. But once we got him in the kennel and we could see the extent of the swelling, uh, we brought him back to the science center for a full hands-on exam, just like if you were to go to the doctor for a physical. Um, it includes blood work, checking the animal's weight, and giving him a hands-on physical. So looking over the animal, looking for other wounds, um, you can see he was really skinny. So it was evident that he had been likely abandoned by mom. Um, it, he was vocal as well when we were hands-on with him. Uh, but here we are taking some blood work to look at blood parameters. Very similar if you were to do a complete blood chemistry or have one done on yourself at the hospital. Um, it can show us various things from sodium levels, glucose levels, potassium levels, oxygen saturation. So there's a lot that we can learn from that. But we also take swab samples, which you just saw Brian doing. Um, for disease surveillance, and then here we are looking at the swelling. The amount of infection just from the animal moving around on the surface, the amount of infection that came out of that wound on its own was impressive for such a small animal. Uh, so generally these animals are 20 to 25 pounds at birth. So knowing that this animal was two to three, three to four weeks old, he should have been a lot bigger than that, and he was only 19 pounds. So he was smaller than what he should have been at work weight. Yeah, and what you what you explained about the infection, you know, uh, we didn't add some of that to that video because it was so, it, there was a lot of it and it was it was kind of gross. Um, maybe if you were in, into watching like Dr. Pimple Popper or something, you would have really enjoyed it. But um, we actually do have some photos now from Zeus's rehab, which I can share. Um, and Lisa can chat a little bit more about, um, you know, the infection that was on his face and, and what his rehab looked like. Yeah, so, um, yeah, there we go. This was um, as soon as he arrived at NMLC. Um, this is a photo um, right after. So, I mean, uh, you know, um, it's always great when uh, Ashley and Brian, they prepare us for, you know, what we're expecting. Um, so we, we were aware of this wound and, and infection. Um, so we <clears throat> we took some photos initially to, um, you know, come up with the game plan. And uh, so this was before our treatment. Um, we uh, went together with our veterinary team. We, we opened up that abscess 
and and drained it. Um, there was a after what um, SSC had already um, extracted from that wound, we um, we removed um, even more um, pus and, and fluid, and you can see the dimensions of this um, sort of uh, the wound that itself is there. We do not know um, exactly um, what inflicted the wound, um, but. Uh, it, it has healed up very well after we, we drained it. Um, and luckily we didn't have to um, drain it again. Uh, that one drainage was enough. Uh, we kept it open so um, that it could drain more. Uh, what we really like to do is to, you know, use natural um, resources as well for, for cleaning um, wounds like that. So he had um, salt water treatments um, and that was enough to, to flush it on a daily basis um, together with some um, systemic antibiotics. And um, he, it, the wound healed up really well. It closed up. Um, he recovered quickly. Um, we were all very surprised about that, um, especially since that wound was so close to his uh, muzzle. And it, it, especially when these animals come in really debilitated and we tube feed them, we have to handle their heads a lot. But he was, he was um, tolerating that fairly well. And um, he is uh, certainly one of our fast, most um, um, fast progressing animals in, in, uh, in our hospital at the moment. Nice, yeah. Um, it also, as, as you were speaking, Lisa, I saw Ashley making some faces on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> we do have another, another seal that we're uh, working. So yeah, at the same exact location. So one seal oh. turned into two and so yeah. it, it goes it goes to show how this real like seriously this is the busiest time of year for a lot of our organizations and you know what that that'll lead right into um I, I, unless lisa was there any anything else regarding uh zeus that you wanted to to touch on um no i think the wound was really um you know the most significant we could see the inflammation and um uh, the infection in his blood work. Uh, what was interesting, another finding after we do our advanced diagnostics, we noticed that he had ingested some of the small pebbles. It looks like seeing that that rescue location um, is, is a good um, sort of indicator where these pebbles might have come from. Um, yeah. Luckily, they were, um, you know, really small size. So uh, they typically um, seals can just naturally um, pass those um, through their um, GI system. He's actually scheduled for a follow-up um, x-ray this week um, to, to check that these pebbles are gone. Um, yeah, uh, other than that, he's in our pre-release pool right now um, and uh, he is uh, starting to eat on his own. So we are, um, are very hopeful that he um, he's on his way to release when, oh, when he's awesome. ready. Yeah, Good. that's great to hear. That's awesome stuff. Um, <laughs> thanks, Lisa. And so with that, we're going to move on to our final bit, how you can help. And this this relates very well to Ashley's situation right now, um, you know, in our, on our hotline. Like we're you know, we're seeing a lot of these animals out on the beach. You've just learned about their biology, their physiology, how human interactions affect them. So what can you do at home? Um, I would say one of the first things you can do is to educate your friends and family about what you've just learned today. You can share this video, um, share it on Facebook, share it on um, YouTube, share it with, you know, just, just share it at home when you're hanging out this 4th of July with your friends and family. Um, that's a, that's definitely a big thing. And I know as, as Ashley mentioned, and this is a common theme, all of these, a lot of these human interaction cases, people mean well. It's just a matter of, we, you know, they don't know exactly what these animals need and they're trying to help and they end up actually doing more harm than good. So um, do any of you have any tips on how, you know, other ways that people can get involved or other ways that they can, you know, spread the word? Maybe yeah, Ainsley. I can start with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, as Ashley and Brian both said, people often mean well, but because they don't know what to do, their actions end up hurting more than helping. Um, so by attending these events, by visiting these facilities, you can go see SQL Science Center or take a tour at NMLC's Discovery Lab. You can learn more and you can be a great ambassador for us and help spread the word. Um, yep. So definitely educating yourself, sharing that with your friends, your families. If you're in a community Facebook group or a dog walker group and you're seeing posts about I saw a seal, I didn't know what to do, can somebody help me? You can share that information and say, here's the phone number 
please stand back, I'll, I'll help you get the right information. And really cutting yeah. down on some of the well-meaning but not correct suggestions people might throw out. People might say, call the police. And while they can certainly put us in touch, that ties up local resources that can help humans. So, so that's not a good option to tie them up. People might say, oh, call this other organization that's in a different state because I know they do this. And that just delays getting the right care as well. If you have our phone number saved, we can be the fastest to respond, to take that information. And you can even scan this QR code with your phones if you open up the camera and it'll help add your our, uh, stranding hotline right to your phone, or you can save it in there as well, especially if you are a boater, if you're a dog walker on the beach in the mornings, if you live right near the beach, this is the best thing you can do to be ready to help call in a situation. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'll leave this up just for another moment here too, so folks can, you know, who are watching can uh, save that in their, ho in, the, in their cell phones as well. And I know uh, the Seco Science Center, I'll put up our hotline as well if you live in New Hampshire and Northern Massachusetts. Um, Ashley or Lisa, is there anything else that you wanted to add to about how folks can help at home? Um, it may sound simple, um, but both National Marine Life Center and here at Seco Science Center, um, not only you know donating financially if you're able to do so, um, but both of our organizations also have an Amazon wish list. Um, so that's something you know where people you know, there's items on there that are as low as, you know, four or five dollars. Um, so if, you know, there's something that you think, you know, you might want to send to our organizations off of that Amazon wish list, those are things that we literally get them in the mail and then we're using them right away um, on different animal cases. And not only from, you know, simple things when we go out to the beach, like towels or gloves that our responders put on, but, you know, right down to things that we use for the examinations and you know diagnostics of these animals as well. Um, any little bit helps any of our organizations. We are reliant on the public support. Um, but not only that, just spreading the word. You know, a lot of people don't realize that it's completely normal for seals to haul out on the beaches. Uh, not so much for dolphins, whales, or porpoises, but for seals, they're only semi aquatic. So they do come out on land. Um, as they get a little bit older, they figure out the smart and not so smart spots to haul out and will often choose rocky outcroppings or sandbars. Um, but for these young animals, they're completely naive to the dangers of public and dogs being around them. Um, so it's it's important for us to take a stand for them and to help them out and to let them be wild animals. Yeah, great points. And what about you, uh, Lisa? You have any any closing closing thoughts? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would like to add on to that. Um, um, yeah, I think the best thing to to help is you know definitely. I think a lot lot of information for us goes through social media, whether that is wish list information, um, other campaigns that we do, um, a lot of cool stuff as well. Sometimes really nice, you know, apparel for people, um, but also a lot of educational information. Um, we do. Um, have some educational um, programs or sessions where you can learn a lot more about what we do and the species we work with. We also, if you want to stay informed and really kind of, you know, see seals, um, even if it's on the screen, you, we do um, uh, patient updates uh, live, the same for releases. So you really get to see um, a lot of animals from a safe distance. And, um, and you also learn a little bit more since we're talking about human interaction and really exposure. This is obviously a big topic for us um, when these animals are in house. Um, we try to minimize our contact with these animals as much as we can. Of course, they are in, um, under our medical care, so we do have to work with them, but we try to minimize it because um, these, these animals are very smart. Um, they, they can get used to humans and habituate and we try to prevent it. And if, um, if you join us for um, patient updates, you see the preventative measures that we take in house, um, whether that is noise reduction, visual barriers, just um, strategic ways to work with these animals, you can learn a lot more. So um, your support is very much appreciated, whether that is by spreading the word or donations. We absolutely rely on you and we're very thankful for, for all your um, support. Nice. Great, great words there, Lisa. Um, and yeah, I think closing up, you know, the, the name of the game when it comes to if you ever see one of these animals on the beach, 
R E S P E C T. Respect <laughs> the space of these animals. Keep back. Observe them naturally. You know, when you move up close, they're they're aggressive. They'll try and bite you. You know, they they you're they're behaving unnaturally when you move close. Um, and observing them from a distance, um, it really allows you to to appreciate how incredible these animals are and how lucky we are to have them on our coastline up here. So, respect. Um, and you know, in, enjoy enjoy the Fourth of July weekend. Enjoy uh, this beach season. Um, but definitely, any any wildlife, just understand that we are you know this this is a, a very delicate time of year lots of people on the beach lots of wildlife on the beach um you know the, we we cross our paths this time of year and and the best thing that we can do um is keep back and call in any animals that you see we will talk you through it i know ashley ashley's really good at this um if you ever call our hotline ashley will tell you exactly what you need to be doing um <laughs> as as it's happening and she's probably about to do that right now so um, <laughs> luckily yeah. it's a quiet beach day um but yeah. as we spoke about human interaction just last weekend um we picked up another animal that's down at national marine life center that was heavy human interaction um, somebody was sitting with it on the beach at nighttime um somebody poured water on it and we found fresh scallops in the sand right next to the animal indicators that people tried to feed it as well um, yep. So that animal bounced all around all weekend, stranded five times before we finally were able to get our hands on him. Yep. Um, so we just ask that if you see them, just give them some space. And eventually they'll go back into the water on their own as long as they're feeling pretty good. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. So thank you everyone for taking the time and, and, you know, sharing your expertise with folks out there and uh, yeah, share this far and wide with your friends and family and enjoy the beautiful weather respectfully. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. Thank you.